details. So today's lecture will be about understanding that the web is multiple pieces, including HTTP. Uh, we have some naming uh, conventions. How do you name the content? Because whenever you need to request an object, you need to be able to name it. So we don't use an address, but a naming scheme. Uh, we use HTML because this is a language that is used in order to specify uh, a page, because this is what we're going to have inside the browser is a web page, and we use HTML for this. Obviously, in our case, we will go over the details of HTTP, and because of the P, it means that it's a protocol, and because it's a protocol, as we already explained, we have messages with a given format, different types, depending on the header. So each of them going to have their own header. Uh, and what I mean by header is how do you fill the information that are needed? The same way when you send uh, a mail, right? You need to write the name, first name, and so on, and the address. So it needs to be to have a specific structure. So we will study about it, which is a pretty simple one, actually. And then see how this protocol runs. And we need to see what is below HTTP, because HTTP is using a lower level protocol, which is TCP. So I'm going to go over the details and, and finish with cookies, caching, and introduce DNS, because this is what we're going to see on Monday. All right. So as you may remember, we said the internet is a two-tier architecture. At the edge, we have the end host, meaning servers or uh, clients, if it's a client-server application. And the purpose here is to see that in the middle of the network, I have routers, and the purpose of the router is to forward the packets along a path, OK? Um, so routers just forward the packets. So they have a few things like IP addresses let you uh, compute the path. But today, we're going to uh, study the host, meaning that the host is hosting the application. So this is where you run the application, where you can install them, right? And one of those examples is the web. The protocol that is used is HTTP. And in order to guarantee some of the properties, we need TCP, which is below. So we will see about that, uh, how you interact. But in any case, if you want to develop an application, OK, in that case, a browser, all applications in the internet use a programming interface, an API. And that API is provided by the layer 4, OK? So yes, we go from seven to four, we skip five and six, that's the way it is. I can go into the details, but just let keep it this way. There's no layer five and six. So it means that in that case, for any application that you want to design, you have two choices. Either you use TCP, which is a lower level protocol, or UDP. In the case of HTTP, it's TCP that we're going to use. TCP will provide with all the mechanism to make it reliable, to send requests, and get the objects. OK, so as I explained on the client, this is a browser. So here we have Chrome. And on the other side, we have servers such as Apache, which is one kind of HTTP server. But in any case, whenever you want to develop any application in the internet, you always use the same API. And the API is pretty simple. It's like a library with functions such as send, receive, and so on. So those are basic functions that you can use whenever you develop your application. OK, so regarding the web, we have three main ingredients. So as I explained first, we have naming convention. So since we need to download pages, pictures, videos, multiple type, multiple type of objects, we need to be able to name them. And here, the convention so is using URLs. And part of it, even though I'm going to go in further details in the next slide, we have the method, which is here the protocol that we're using. Why? Because most of your, your browsers may use other protocols. So it means that it's not only about the web. They can also do, for instance, FTTP, which is only file transfers. OK, so that's the reason we specify uh, the protocol in that case, because the browser can run multiple protocols. Today, we're going to focus on HTTP. And most of the time, that's the one you use. But you can see that if you put FTP and you can connect to a server, it's going to run FTP. Then we have the name of the server. And this is basically what needs to be resolved as an IP address using DNS. And then uh, how to access uh, the object that I want, which is here a JBEG picture. Okay? So this is a naming convention. You, you, you know better about it. 
because this is what you need to input in your browser. Then we have HTML. Okay, so I guess that you already uh, saw this language uh, in uh, other lectures or even experiment by yourself. So this is the, the, the way that we use here in order to design web pages. And one of the main properties is the fact that actually in those pages, if you have objects, those objects need to be referenced by a specific name. So it means that if you have the page, the page is actually the base document, right? Which provide the structure with the text. But whenever you have a picture, the picture is a separate object. So which means that, and one of the difficulties here is when I want to download a page, I need first to get the page and you have empty holes, gaps, that you need to fill by downloading separately each of the objects of this page, such as pictures. So which means that one request for one page is not enough if it has more than just text. If you have pictures, you need also to download those pictures one by one. So if you have 10 pictures, it means that you need to do 11 transfers, one for the web page plus the 10 pictures. And that's all here are the, are the difficulty that we're going to have. Okay, and in order to request those objects, we need we uh, use HTTP. Okay, so those are the three ingredients. So regarding the naming, so you may see that we have other type of keywords that are used. So those are not really different. So the URL. So I'm sorry here, it's all messed up. I don't know the reason, but it's because the character I'm using are different. So anyway, so the URL goes as uh, this. So this part here. Is a URL, okay, and this is mainly the one uh, we want we, uh, we will use, okay. So uh, what is important, as I said, the method, which is a protocol, and the server name, that is very important as well, plus the path to the object, okay. And so as, so as I said, the the page have multiple objects, which can be of, of multiple types. So uh, your browser is able to actually render multiple type of objects. And uh, each of those objects, which are actually embedded in the page, come with a specific tags here, mockup tags, that would indicate where to find that picture. Okay, so this is, this is the way it works. So HTTP, the protocol itself, so uh, it stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. There are actually two main versions, and we're gonna focus on version 1.0 and 1.1, given that now we are pushing the 2.0, okay? But it's not widely uh, available, okay? It's been pushed lately, uh, mainly by, by Google, who has implemented it, but mo most of the time we are using the version 1.1, okay? So I will explain the differences between 1.0 and 1.1. And this protocol uh, follows a client-server model, which means that the server is on standby, so the server is a kind of a daemon that runs forever, and it's, it waits for requests coming from clients. A client is always a browser, whether it's like Safari on your iPhone or Chrome on your laptop, they run the same protocol, okay? And uh, basically, uh, it's connectionless. This is very important, so which means that we don't have any states. So whenever you send a request, your browser is not supposed to remember about what are the objects that he was expecting. So it means that the messages should be as much as possible safe contained. They need to include all the information without relying on the fact that you have states. So we will explain the reason we choose to design it as stateless. Obviously, it's for a matter of to make it more scalable because if the servers need to maintain states regarding each of the clients, that wouldn't be scalable, okay? And one other, other thing that is quite specific to HTTP is the fact that it's an ASCII protocol. It's text-based, which means that if you want to decode HTTP, the only thing that you need when you have a message is to know the ASCII codes. So if you have an ASCII table, all you need to understand the message is to read the character one by one and to see, okay, so here is the bits, what is the value? And you can basically read by yourself what they mean by HTTP. That's not the case of uh, many other protocols, but that's the way it's been designed in the case of HTTP. So we're going to go into those details. So text-based, what does it mean? It means that basically the header uh, is given in plain text, if I can say so. So it means that if I want to put the message get in HTTP message, 
it means that the sequence of bits will be the ASCII code. So uh, 47 is J, E, T, right? So that's how you specify it. So that's not the case of all the protocols because mainly a bunch of other, the, other protocols that we're going to study. So I don't know if I, yeah, like IP, DCP, UDP, I binary. Binary, what do you mean by that? It means that actually we don't specify the name of the field. Okay, in the case of FCDP, we will see that the header had met multiple lines. Each line is a field. The field will first specify the name of the field followed by the value of the field. In the case of IP, I don't need to give the name of the field. The reason is because we know the location. If you know the location of the value, we know to which field it uh, referred to. So if you take the IP header, the first field is always the field version. It's on four bits, and you have different type of values, which can be IPv4 or IPv6. Uh, if you're looking for the IP, the protocol field, this is a specific field where you're going to have a specific value. Uh, the offset is of nine, so it's eight uh, bytes. So the, I think that here I give an offset in bytes. Yeah, it's nine bytes after the start of the header. So the location give you the meaning of the value. In the case of HTTP, no, the meaning of the value is given by the name of the field. I will show you this. But anyway, you need to consider that the text-based are very few of them, uh, and they are quite old protocols, knowing that nowadays we mostly have binary. Okay, so as it's a protocol, so once again, we need to specify things, and we're going to go over those first. We need to define the type of messages, and we're going to see that we have two types of messages, pretty simple, one request, one response. That's it. Uh, of course, for a request, we have multiple type of request, but the message, the structure of the message remain the same. Then we need to have the message syntax, which means that how can we provide uh, the different fields of the header, all right? So how to specify them? So it's text-based, we already said about it. And of course, the meaning of each of the fields. But most of the time, because of the name of the field, we, we pretty can well understand what is the meaning of the field. And then we have the rules. And the rules are really important. It means that when I receive a get, what do you expect? I expect to receive a response. So there is a sequence of processing and messages that I should receive in a specific order. Okay, so those are the rules. As we already said as an example, when you pick up the phone, you say, hello. Right? So that's a rule. In HTTP, we have rules like this. We already said that it's connectionless for HTTP, but that's specific to HTTP. We can have other protocols, even at the application layer, which actually are stateful. In the case of, of HTTP, we don't maintain any state regarding the messages that either I send or receive. That's the way it is. And we're going to see that that may have side effects. Okay, So it's always, when we design something, networks is always about a trade-off. Sometimes it comes with some pros, but you also have cons Okay, all the time. So you need to uh, basically weight those and see which one will outweigh. If a cons will basically outweigh uh, a pro. So it's open protocol, so which means that it's, been, it's specified. So you can read the specification online. online. Uh, those comes uh, as AFCs. Those documents mean request or comments, and they are fully available on the website of the IETF.org. So those guys are in charge of standardize everything, every protocol in the internet. So if you want to design your own browser, that would be the first source of information that you need to go see, okay, and understand how is it working to implement your browser to make it actually interoperable with any other servers on the internet, OK? That's not the case for all protocols. So uh, we have a bunch of protocols that we actually install, and we only have the binary, OK? We download from uh, Apple Store or the App Store, and that's it. And we don't know the details or the source or what is the protocol that is used, OK? So those are actually, there are not multiple versions of our clients. For Skype, for instance, there's one client, and that's it. Nobody else can compete by designing their own software to uh, make your Skype call. In the case of HTTP, we have a bunch of protocols. Why? Because the specification are open. If you have questions, please interrupt me, OK? I know it's a, it's a long introduction, but we're going to get into uh, much more details. So if anything is bothering you, don't worry, guys. You can interrupt me anytime. 
Um, so as I already explained, so uh, when you have HTTP at the layer seven, we use TCP, which means that TCP will add a header on top of the HTTP message. And going through the other layer, we're gonna have the IP layer, and those are gonna add a new header as well. So HTTP have its header, on top of this, we have the TCP header. On top of this, we have the IP header. And on top of this, we have the link layer uh, header, which come also with a trailer. So one of the things that you need to do whenever you send those headers is to fill the values. And in the case of HTTP, there are some very uh, key values that you may have. So first of all, regarding the IP address, obviously, it derives from the name. So once you give the name of the host, of the server, it's pretty simple to know what is the IP using DNS. Right? So that's what DNS is for. So if you want to go on cnn.com, you only need to send a request to the DNS server who will give you the IP, and then based on the IP, you will fill the header. So as you may see here, you have a dependency. If the user doesn't know the IP of the server, HTTP depends on DNS. So it means that if you cannot get the IP of the server, HTTP cannot work. So there's a dependency here. All right. uh, regarding TCP, we always said in the introduction that in the header, the IDs are important at the port number. And here, hopefully, by default, when you want to connect to a web server, the web server is listening on what we call the port number 80. And that is by convention. So I don't need to actually check any directory to make sure that, oh, what is the port number for that web server? No, it's always going to be 80, OK, by default, hopefully. And we already said that on the side of uh, the client, usually this is a random value uh, that needs to be uh, larger than uh, 10, uh, greater than 10, 123. All right. anyway. So here is um, the format of the messages for HTTP. So it's pretty simple. So a header, okay, it's indicated. So I do I have, uh, no, I don't have an animation here yet. So the header is everything in purple here. Okay. And so this is a header. This is what you add on top of the data. Of course, if it's a request, obviously when you send a request, there's no data. But it may have cases where you have data. For instance, when your request is to upload a picture on Facebook, okay, so you ask the server through a request to put some data online. So of course, this is what you're gonna have in the body, in the payload, right? But if the request is not about uploading anything, you don't need the data. So most of the time, this will be empty if it's a request, okay? In specific cases, you may have data embedded in your request. So regarding the header, as we say, here the first line is always what we call the request line. I'm gonna go over the details. And then we have a bunch of lines which we call header, header line. Those header lines, the number is variable. But nowadays, we have like a, a lot of them, a lot of them, all right? So we're gonna take some examples later. So since everything is about ASCII, we need first to be able to separate the header from the data. And so here, we're gonna use those two ASCII codes. So if you wanna know where is your header ending, you need to go look for, in hex, O-D-O-A, O-D-O-A, O-O is a zero anyway, okay? So those are the specific characters, which is a carry, return and line fee. They have specific values, and if you go in a table, this is the one you're gonna find. So that indicates that this is the end of your header. And for each line, you use one of them. So one carry line, a carriage return line feed indicates the end of the line. And so then you have another line starting. So this is pretty standard. Um, and we will see that Within each of them, so you may have multiple fields. And to put the separation between each of the fields, we use a space. So I'm gonna take examples, don't worry. So let's see a little bit in details more. So as I said, the header request. So we have three fields. Look, they are separated by spaces. So this is the ASCII code. So this is really in binary what you have. So two spaces indicating that you have three fields. The, three, the first field is a method. 
So the type of method, for instance, can be a get, G-E-T, in cap letter. Here yeah. you have the URL, which is actually, you have to be a little careful because it doesn't include the host. The host will be provided on the separate line. So here, what you have, you have the path to the object. The path to the object. And then the version that you use. And that is standardized. So this one should always be there. Following that first line, you have header lines. And as usual, the name, the value. The name, the value. And those, the length, are variable, depending on the type of value on the, on the name. And as I said, then the body. All right. Okay. So let's take a let's take a look at the at the at the different type of, of of methods that I have. So we have the get. Pretty simple. Is when I need to uh, fetch an object. Uh, put is whenever I need to store an object that is provided in the body, and I indicate where to put it. There's a post. So the post is a little similar to the get, but this is basically whenever you have, a, when you search on Google, you put some keywords. So you need to submit your request by providing keywords. So those keywords may be provided in the body of your request. Okay, so that's the reason you use a post. Uh, you have the head as well. So the head is pretty much the same with the get, but actually is only, uh, when, when you get something uh, returned here, it will be without the body, okay? And then you have delete because whenever you put something, you need to be able to delete it. So this is how it looks. So this is the real bits that I capture on the network when I'm sending a HTTP request. So the lines here, actually, so you have, you, you have bytes. So you see that 47 is a byte. The, set, the byte, by byte number one, sorry, it's number one, so I don't need that. So byte number one is 45 and so on. So I put numbers. So this line here is a number of the line. And the, the, the number refer to the first byte of the line. And so since in hex, it means that this is 16. It means that how many bits on one line? It goes from zero to 15. So I have 16 bytes per line. And those is whenever you listen on the wire, those are the bits that you see. So they are provided in hex, which means that two hex numbers is one byte. Everybody got this? Okay, this is pretty standard. So I don't think that it should be a problem. And here, this is just the number of the line. So it means that the bits are not, this is not included in the message. It's just for us to be able to number the lines. So what I did here, First of all, as we said, okay, one of the things that we need to do is to ID the lines and the different fields. So let's go with this. So you may see that here in gray uh, boxes, what did I put? The key values. And you remember that the key values are in hex 20, because those are the spaces, plus the 0D0A, which mark the end of a line. Can you see the two, different, the two different type of boxes? So which means that now you may see that the first field is a get, is a method, pretty simple. Then I have your URL, and as I explained before, that doesn't include the host. The host is provided here. So here I only have, in, in the URL, I have the path to access to that object. Then I have the version, and what is the version I'm using is 1.0, but I still need to provide HTTP slash 1.1. Then this is the end of the request line, the line request, and now I'm starting having uh, the header lines. And as you may see, I have different fields. So this field here is a field host, and for that host, I have the name of the host. Okay, this is W, whatever, NPA in, on, on in France. So then I have another line. So, um, so here you need to be able to use your ASCII code to be able to tell what is the value here. So can anybody tell me 43, what is 43 in ASCII? Which character is this? Can you check online? 
because anyway, you, you, we know that 45 is E, so it should be is a C. Yes, it's C. Then is, I guess, O, N, N. 65 should be what? Or oh, maybe I'm wrong. Is it a O? Yes, it, it's a O, N, N. Come on, guys, a, a little help here. Uh, e. E. C. C. Uh, no, E. Why, why did I put the I? E. I, O. No, I have something uh, wrong here. So connect. 69. So 69 is missing. Connecting, maybe. Oh. Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't bet about it, but anyway, C then C O N N E C T. You you can find the table. You cannot find the table uh, online. It's O. 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 So N and 3A. What is 3A? Two dot. Yeah. So you see, so you you are providing a field name with this connection and then the value. Okay, so I let you carry on. I think that I have, so yeah, and you see here what we have. Once again, I just put the, 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 the key values here. So you may see that, yeah, we have connection equal, I mean, uh, semicolon, keep a lot. So you see, so this is pretty simple to understand the HTTP message. All you need is to have an ASCII table and to analyze the bits by having the character. So it's text-based, so this is plain text. So you read, you understand. You don't need to have a kind of a code. So what about the response now? So the response is a little different because as you may see for the response line, which is located the first, we have uh, the version. Oh, wow. That's really weird. Uh, I shouldn't say version, I guess, right? This is weird. I mean, version? Oh, I'm not sure if it's version, but anyway, this is where you're going to have words like 200. The state is okay. So what does it mean here? Uh, ver oh, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I'm, yeah, it's my fault. No, what you what you have in version is actually, you know, you request version 1.1, the server answer maybe with a version 1.0. So you need the server need to agree with your version, given that maybe it's gonna downgrade the version that is used. But most of the time, the version is gonna be the same. And then you have the status. 200, the message that goes with it, okay. Do you have any other type of status codes and message that you can have uh, when you receive a response? 200 okay is when every, everything goes well. Yeah, 404. And the message is gonna be not found. And that is bad because you are requesting an object that cannot be found. Yeah, 500 something when there's a gateway problem. So you have a bunch of message, okay? I'm gonna give you a few examples. And the rest is pretty much the same. So you have the header lines, the header lines, name, space, the value, plus uh, 0D, 0A in order to mark the end of the lines. And here again, twice in order then to provide the body. So the body basically will contain the object that you asked for. Okay? So this is the data that you're going to receive. So those are different codes that you have. Yes, you have the 200 OK. You have the 301 to indicate that's actually, I couldn't find the object, but I know that it's moved to another location. So that's pretty handy. So then I can request the object giving that updated location. 400 is when I couldn't understand the request because the syntax was not good. 404, when I couldn't find the object that was uh, add, uh, asked. Uh, 505, when you uh, request for a version that is not supported by the server. So there are many more, you can check in number one. So basically here, this is a typical uh, transaction. So you have a get, okay, that you send to a server, all right? And um, then you indicate few things on top of this. So close, we're gonna see that you need to specify since HTTP is stateless, and we said that HTTP run on top of TCP, TCP, is stateful, so it needs to a connection. 
So once you open the connection with the server to send a request, you need to be able to tell to TCP if you should keep the connection open or if after this request, the connection can be closed. So that's the reason you put this, this keyword here, close. If you don't want to close it, you're going to put the keyword keep alive. And then uh, this is the end of the header. I didn't put those here, but you have the same here, right? But it was obvious because I'm going to the next line. So here it means that I have two of them that indicate the end of the header. And then I have the response that comes once again with a version. Oh, is in French, I'm sorry. So this is a response line with the version. Here it is. Uh, the status, the code, plus uh, the, the, the message that goes with it, okay? And here, as you see, close. Why? Because it's been asked to be closed. So I close a TCP connection. Here I have a bunch of other fields that we're going to explain later. But as you may see here is the language of your browser, so you can set it up. Uh, the type of, of object that you support. So here you can have HTML or JPEG. Okay. And on the server side, so it's interesting to see that you have two dates. Those are different. So the first date indicate when the requests have handled. So when the server processed your request. And this is the age of the object that you've been asking for. So what is, how old is this object? When it was last modified? So it's really important, we'll see later, for caching object, uh, object uh, for caching. This is the size of the data out of the header. So this is without the header. This is the size of the data plus the type of the object. So something that should be a little bit upsetting for you guys is to realize that when you send a request and you receive the response, can you find any information you have the length, the type. Do you have the name of the object or any information regarding the ID of the object? We don't. Remember about this. This is a big issue. OK, so this is a typical, a typical HTTP request. So I already said that we have this field here with a value, which is a date. Uh, this is pretty interesting, because this is what we're uh, going to use. So let's say um, you have, even your browser have a caching. So it means that whenever you receive some objects, those objects are going to be, some of them, available locally on your browser. But one of the problems is, how can I know if they're fresh or not? So in order to tell if they're fresh, you're still going to send a request okay, to the server, who may then reply with a message which is 304, saying that, oh, it's fine. I don't need to uh, resend the object because it hasn't been modified. So it means that then the browser can safely show you the object without actually uh, asking for uh, the server to send it back. Understood? So you may either provide the date, but we also use e-tags, which is another type of field. And the e-tag is a hash of the content. So have you been using hashing functions before? Do you know what is a hash function? Yep. So it's just like a key, a fingerprint, a signature that is unique given an object. So yes, if it changes, it means that the e tag in your browser, in the cache, is different from the server. So I have, a, so you have to be careful here because what I'm saying here, right? So I'm saying that um, I'm the client. I need to request an object which is already available in my cache. So I'm still going to ask to the server, okay? And I'm going to ask the server if it's fresh. And this guy may tell me that, oh, it's OK. It's, it's fresh enough. To you, is it like obvious? Like, but still, I'm going to waste some time here. You see, I still need to wait what we're going to call later one RTT, a round trip time, before I can show to the use of the object. One of the problems with objects and with the web is the fact that the objects may be very big. Okay, if, you if you take a typical picture, if it's in a high res, what is the size of the picture? High res picture. If you take your iPhone and you have the high res, how many, how many bytes for one picture nowadays? Yeah, 20, 20, 25. So that's huge. I mean, that's really big, all right? So you need to remember about this. So sending an object, The larger it is, the more time it's going to take, obviously. But what is the main problem is the fact that the distance 
between the client and the server. If you look at this time here, the transfer time, and I'm not talking about the propagation, right? I'm talking about the transmission, okay? It's actually decreased really fast with the distance. So if the distance between your client and the server is increasing, the time, uh, so maybe, no, I did it, I did it wrong, I'm sorry. It was supposed to be the opposite. So uh, uh, throughput, yeah, it's the throughput. So this is the, the, the throughput that you have. It's going to decrease a lot. So which means that it's really fast if it's close to you, but whenever the, if the object is too far away, the time is going to be even larger the further it is, the server it is. So the problem here is not so much, yes, it's how far is the server, but it's as well how big is the object. So what you want to avoid is that time here. That's going to increase as the server going to be far away. So this time going to be huge. Understood? So that's the reason asking the question, given that the, this message is super small, it gets really fast. But if the object is super big, then it's going to be very late into transferring that object. So one of the main problems with HTTP, and, and, and that's really important because you will also come to design protocols by yourself at the application level, is the fact that you need to interact with TCP, which is the lower level. Okay? And uh, one of the things that we need to do is that we, remembering that once again, one page is the base document plus objects, and you need to download them separately. So one request for object. And then the fact that HTTP doesn't have any connection. It doesn't have any state. So which means that HTTP cannot be reliable by itself. If you don't have states, it's really hard to make it reliable. But HTTP doesn't really care because TCP, which is a lower level, provides a reliable service. So what does it mean? It means that if I look at a typical HTTP uh, session, before you can even send your GET here, you need to sol uh, solicit TCP. And you need to ask him that, OK, I have something to send. But in order for TCP to be able to send your data by adding a header and so on, TCP needs to install the states which are the TCBs. You remember we already talked about, no, did we, did we talk about the TCBs? Anyway, those are the states. This is how we call them. So to install those, TCP needs to send three messages. And those are not HTTP. This is only related to TCP. I send those three messages just in order to install and initiate those states that I need because TCP is reliable. So once you did the installment, okay? So here, 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 and here. You can now send the request. So you see, you already lost one RTT because of TCP. And you remember that even before TCP, what is the other service that I need? Just remember the interactions. So in order to connect with the IP of the server, what do I need to run as a service? Do you, do you remember? To get the IP, I need DNS. So you see, so that's a lot of time, right? DNS, then TCP, and then HTTP. Wow. That takes a lot of time, right? Before you can even send the request. Anyway, so that's the way it is. So then once you have your TCP connection, you can send your HTTP request, OK? And obviously, you need to close to close the TCP connection. Anyway. So one of the questions that we have is, to send a request, I need a TCP connection. So one of the questions would be that, oh, but now we said that, actually, I need to download multiple objects. So the question is, should I use a single TCP connection? Should I use multiple TCP connections? What should I do? Because I have the choice, right? So that, and that is a, the, the design choice is not that easy. Oh, why did I do it here? Yeah, I, I just gonna take the time because you have the assignment of this, just in order to explain the difference that we have between, and that's very important, the transmission time 
and the propagation time. Okay? So the propagation time, you can see it here. It doesn't depend on the size of the message. The transmission is the thickness of the messages that I have. This is a transmission time. This is a transmission time. This is a transmission time. And what do we mean by that? What I mean is when you have bits, you need to transfer them as a signal. Okay, because on the wire, there's no bits, right? It's like my voice, right? The information is encoded through my voice, which is a signal. We do the same with the data. So we have bits, we need to put them in form of the signal, and the signal will propagate on the wire. So the time that it takes to transfer the bits to transmit them as signal, this is what time it takes the most time in a network. So the propagation time usually is very short. So as you can see here, this figure is not made to scale. This is a, this is a really a bad picture. Because normally this time is super, super small compared to the transmission times. Okay? So actually, the propagation is really fast because when you take a signal, how much time does it take for, in the wire for electricity to move from one end to another? Do you know what is the speed? The light speed, yeah. So you see, so even if you are on the other side of the Earth, this is light speed. So the propagation is nothing, you know? Yes, you need to go through multiple nodes. But on the wire, it doesn't take much time. But what takes time? is the fact that actually I need to take the bits and to transmit them, to transform them as a signal. And that is a transmission. And to calculate the transmission time, I need the transmission rate, how many bits per second, and knowing the size of the message, all I need is to take the size of the message divided by the bit rate. So a typical bit rate could be one megabit per second. So now, if I want to analyze the time that it takes to receive the first data, I need to analyze all those different times. And as you may see, they are pretty simple. First, I need to transmit a scene message. Here it is. Then I need this message to propagate. So then it's going to propagate. Then I need to receive the CNAC, because this is a TCP message. We said three messages for TCP. So that's the reason we have one TP here, a second TP. And usually the sum of both, this is what we call the round trip time. Then what do we have? Yes, we have the CNAC, the ACK, the GET, the TPs that I have here, plus the transmission of the data. And that is the time that it takes, actually, once you have a request, you click on the link, the time that it takes to receive the data. Okay, so usually what we're going to do is because, as you may see, the scene, the CNAC, the ACK, and the GET are very small compared to the data. We all, most of the time, we're going to ne neglect those messages. So, which means that if you look into the formula, this, 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 this can be neglect. So, what's going to be left? The four TPs each one RTT, one round trip, you see them here, one, a second one, plus the transmission time of the data. And that is the total time that it takes. And as I explained, the rate will be very small as the RTT increase. That's the property of the internet. The further away it is, the more time it's gonna take. Because your rate, your sending rate, downloading rate, Going to be very, going to, going to, going to be very small. All right, so that's the way it is. So you need this formula. So I, I let you go over it, but as I as I show you here, you have all the details. So let me clean. You have all the details here, and for each TT and TP, and you can have the 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 the, the, the final uh, formula here. All right. All right. So let's go back to the interaction with TCP. So as you see here, one TCP connection. And then one request, one object. So if I have multiple objects, should I keep one TCP connection or should I open multiple TCP connections? And that is a big question, right? How many connections? And that is a design choice. So 
I'm going to take you off the bat here. So what do you think is best? A single connection that you maintain for all objects, or should you have as many TCP connections as objects? Yeah, OK. Um, so I understand that it's a little tricky because it depends on, on the whose side are you answering, right? If I'm the server, do I like having multiple TCP connections? No, because each TCP connection is going to bring more overhead on the server, right? But if I'm the client, maybe it's good to have multiple TCP connections. So you see, so it may be good for the server to have only one. Maybe for the client, having, having multiple TCP connections may be good. Nowadays, even your browser will block the number of connections that you can have. So it means that even you open multiple tabs to a web server, you have a limit of six. If you try to open one more connection, you're going to be blocked. Okay. So nowadays, the recommendation is use one TCP connection as much as you can. Right. All right. So, and we'll see that. Okay. So if we have uh, one connection, should I send the get one by one? Meaning that before I can send my other get, I need to receive the object. So then I can send the second get. Or should I basically send them all and then receive the objects that I was requesting. So this is without pipelining and this is with pipelining. So what do you think is best? Should we send all the gets at once and then receive the answers or not? What should we do? Up to you once again. Send all. Yes. Okay. I get, I get your answer. All right, so let's see about the modes. So when we use, um, how to say, multiple TCP connections, the mode is the one that has been used in the version 1.0 and is the non-persistent mode. So what it means, the TCP connection is not persistent. So as we may see, I have here three objects, one, two, three. And for each of them, TCP connection, TCP connection, TCP connection. So TCP1. TCP2 and TCP3. So it means that before I can get my object, before I can send, oops, it's here, the get, I need to establish a TCP connection. All right? All right. Uh, when I'm in the persistent mode, as you may see here, how many TCP connection? One TCP connection, one TCP connection, and that's all. You only have one and you keep it open. When you have without pipelining, it means that I need to receive an object before I can ask for the next one. When it's pipelined, I can get, send all my gets out, and then I wait for the pictures to arrive one by one. OK? So those are the main three modes. Actually, I was, I was not very, uh, very uh, how to say, precise here. Uh, you can either have uh, serial TCP connections, one after the other in the sequence, or you can have them in parallel. But you see that you still need to receive the HTML page to make sure that actually you know the list of objects inside the page Then that then you may start requesting. But once you have the list of objects because you scrapped the HTML page, you can start requesting those objects. And for each object, you can have parallel TCP connections. OK, in parallel. So either you have the serial that we've seen before, or you can even do parallel. All right? So those behaviors are, are possible. Even though, as I said, with the version 1.1, we strongly suggest that you should keep alive one TCP connection and you send all your requests in the same TCP connection. All right. So um, once again, the reason is because, as I said, when you have multiple TCP connections, you're going to bring a lot of uh, overhead on your servers. And this is something that you don't want to do. So the servers don't really like it. And basically, nowadays, most of them, they track the IPs. And in case they see too many connections coming from the same computer, they, uh, they basically uh, 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 decline the TCP connection. Okay, so 
No need to try because even nowadays the servers protect themselves. Okay, Barry, I'm going to take your question uh, in a minute. All right. Exactly, Aline. I'm going to go back to you to you too. Right. So that's the reason uh, we don't suggest uh, this behavior. But actually, that's something that you should know that I'm going to introduce right right away. So when you're using a network, so the network is basically a pipe. And through this pipe, all the traffic is going to go through this pipe. And so the pipe, the width of the pipe, is given by the, the sending weight. So it means how many bits per second can I send through the pipe. So what you need to know is when you have multiple TCP connections, TCP, connect, TCP is pair which means that if you have three TCP connections, each TCP connection is going to receive one-third of the bit rate. So at some point, some people say that, oh, OK, if I get one-third, so it means that the more connection I'm going to open, the more bandwidth I'm going to get. If you only want doing this, so if everybody play ball and they have one connection, and inside the same room, I'm going to say, well, hmm, I'm going to have multiple TCP connections. So it means that somehow you're going to get more ascending rate. Do you understand this? If it's fair. But once again, it works only if you the only one actually increasing the number of TCP connections. All right? So that's the reason people say that it's, it's pointless to open so many TCP connections. Because at the end, if everybody inside the same room starts doing the same, it doesn't bring any benefit except the overhead on the servers. So that's the reason now in 1.1, we said, oh, don't do this. It doesn't help, right? Um, so as I said, now most of your browsers have a limit embedded. So even in Chrome, if you have 10 tabs to your favorite website, most of them won't be active. Only six can be, up to six can be active. Uh, what is more? One of the good things, and what we'll see about TCP, is normally the sending rate of a connection increase with time. So the more data you send, the more your sending rate will increase. This is how TCP works. So you start very slow, and you increase. So the longer is your connection in time, the more bandwidth you're going to have. So that's one thing. One of the problems that have been raised by uh, Aline is the fact that uh, we have one of the problems relates to uh, the pipeline, pipelining. So today, we don't do pipelining. And you have to understand the reason for it. If you do pipelining and you send your get in a given order, so this is object one, two, and three, if the server, for some reason, including it has bugs, send you the object in a different order, is there any way for your browser to put them back in order? If you look at the HTTP header, we already said that when you receive an object, there's no information regarding the object. So in case your server is bogus, yeah, instead of having your profile picture on your Facebook uh, profile, you're going to have the picture of somebody else. And there's no way you can correct this. So in order to prevent this behavior here, what is the only way to prevent this from happening is removing pipelining. So that's a problem. We don't do pipelining anymore because there's no way you can reorder the object and put them at the right spot in the web page. Because you remember, HTTP is stateless. So when you send those gets, you lose memory. You don't even know what you were asking for. So you receive some objects. You don't even check if actually, do I need those objects? You don't even know. You don't have states. So you pass them to the browser. And you try to fill the holes without knowing which name goes where. So you see, so the only way to put an order and to respect the structure of the page is to remove pipelining. Okay, so that's too bad. But as Aline was saying, um, we have the big problem is what we call, and this is a very famous problem in computer science, the head of the line blocking. So it means that if your first get is for the la larger object of the page, you're going to stock the whole page before you receive the big object. That's one of the side effects of the version 1.1. And that's the reason we are moving slowly to the version 2. 
Okay, so uh, once again, we say that it's stateless, all right? Um, so stateless is good for the scalability, which means that you avoid overloading uh, the server. But as you may see, uh, having no state is not very good for the browsers. So in order to make up for not having states, we introduce the cookies. You heard of cookies, right? Uh, they are very, uh, very powerful. All right, and what is a cookie? A cookie is a piece of information that you're going to install on your browser. So you're the one who actually allow the browser using them, right? You can totally disable them if you like so. But what is a cookie bringing? So let me show you first how it works. So let's say you're a client, right? And you're going to connect to a server. So each server, okay, have a database. And in the database, they're going to start recording as many information regarding different clients. So when you connect for the first time, let's say it's your first time you connect to Amazon. So Amazon going to ID the fact that, oh, this is a new user. I haven't seen this IP or any information regarding this client in the past. So what are they going to do? When they're going to send you the request, they're going to put a header field, which is called the set cookie, with a value, a unique value within this database. And sending back this response, your browser is going to install the fact that if you need to request something in the future from Amazon, you always need to specify this ID for the cookie. So it means that the next time you visit Amazon, Amazon go to the database, fetch as much information regarding your previous activity, either on Amazon or other websites. And that is a big issue because the people who actually maintain databases with your cookie can cross-reference multiple databases that belongs to different companies. And so what I mean is having your cookie in Amazon is not so much of a problem, but if we start now cross-referencing your activity on multiple websites, yeah, this is where we can get a bunch of information regarding your behavior. And that's one of the problems why cookies nowadays uh, are, are, are not so well accepted, okay? So this is how it works. So it means that the cookies are there forever. So even if you don't go back on Amazon for 10 years, they're going to see you again, OK? And they're going to recognize you. So recognizing you means that, for instance, if in the, uh, the, your shopping cart you have an object that you left there, by the time that you reconnect to, the, 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 to Amazon because of the cookie, he will remember, oh, this guy was trying to purchase this kind of object. Let's put the item back into the cart. So there are multiple usage. And most, some of them are very handy for the user, but some others are not. Okay, but this is very basically how it works. Okay, so this is a new field name, an ID, a specific ID that actually it maintained in your browser. So somehow you can ask your browser to empty the cookie, such as in the future, you lose your password, everything that has been recorded regarding a web page that you are uh, consulting. Okay, good. So then we talked about the caching. I'm trying to run a little faster because we uh, have seven minutes left. So the caching, so we said so either it happens on the browser, which have a web cache, but hopefully what you would do, instead of going all the way to the server, because we said that the further the object is located, the more time it will take to fetch the object. So in order to speed up the process, we bring the copy closer to the client. Okay, so it means that here the round trip to the proxy, which is a cache, is much closer than the original server. So it means that obviously here, since the caches are supposed to be very close, so the caches can be anywhere. They can be either at the, the router of your ISP. So for all uh, the clients of the ISP, he may have a, a cache outside its network. Uh, the, the campus may have a cache as well to prevent too many requests to the outside. And nowadays, what you need to know is most of the objects, like at least 50% of what you download from the, from the internet, comes from caches. So the objects are not the original copies, even though they are totally synchronized, come from the servers. They come from caches. Otherwise, you would be less happy browsing the web, because it would take much more time to download pictures, for instance, which are very large. Okay, so caches work really well. Okay, so what we try to reduce here is the latency, but mainly, as I explained, because of the throughput. Because the closer is the object, the higher throughput you're going to have. So what I mean by that is, like, if you look at the throughput once again, 
and you look at your RTT, the throughput goes something like this. So it means that if the copy that you're looking for is not really close to you, it's going to take forever to download it, right? So those are the caches. You also have some companies, and I, I, I really suggest that you go read a little because this is very interesting. Uh, some caches are provided by what we call CDN companies. Have you call, heard about CDNs? CDNs means content delivery networks. And examples of those guys who are billionaires, right? They make so much money on the internet. This is crazy. And uh, this is, for instance, Akamai. If you haven't heard of Akamai, go see what it is. It's just they provide caches for uh, some uh, objects. And sometimes when you download the page, actually the objects, which are very the pain in the ass because they're already big, they are hosted by CDNs such as Akamai. Akamai has thousands of caches around the world. And whenever you do a request, they will know exactly where to reroute your request to obtain the object the closest from where you are. All right, so please read about it. So as I said, okay, so uh, we have ISPs having them, companies do that, universities do that. So basically, you try to keep the users happy, but as well, you need to reduce the money they need to pay because the more objects, the more bytes you download from the network, since you are, they charge you by the volume of traffic, the more traffic, the more money. So yes, you keep your uh, sales department happy because you don't spend so much money on the internet and the user's happy because they get the object really fast. Okay, so double win, okay? Um, so um, once again, so you, you still need to contact the server most of the time. So once again, uh, even though somehow you go through a cache, uh, the cache will still need to check with the server if it's fresh enough and then you're going to send the object. But as I explained, the most important is the fact that when you receive the object from the cache, it's really fast. If you need to obtain the object from the server, for the same object, the same size is going to take much more time to send it back, all right, because of the throughput that is lower. So that is the objective of the caches. All right, so as we may see, the web itself is very simple. It's a very basic protocol. So uh, the guys who invented this, right, they were not even computer scientists, right? It was very simple. I mean, you can see through the header, right? You just put ASCII code. All right, big deal about it, right? Uh, but the most important is the fact that actually you need to interact with a lot of things, the caches, the DNS, TCP, and what makes HTTP a pain in the ass is this interaction with those protocols. And in order to tune HTTP to work fine, you need to tune the caching, you need to tune DNS, and you need to have TCP running. So basically, nowadays, we have caches for the web. We have caches for the DNS. And Google, at this time, is trying to you remember the first RTT because of TCP. This very first RTT before you can get the get, Google is trying to remove this one too, such as you can send right away the get. So if you want to read about it, they just try to install a, a TCP cookie, such as if you do a connection in the past with a server, you can reuse those states through the use of a cookie that can reactivate your TCP connection even if it's been closed in the past. So everything, why? Because you want to remove the time that you need to start receiving the first bytes. So they try really to uh, optimize as much as they can okay, by removing those times. Okay. So the conclusion, so once again, you have multiple ingredients uh, for the web, including HTTP, which was basically uh, of interest to us, all right? Um, there are uh, multiple components. So we see you have a client, we have a server, but in the middle now, we are adding proxies. And HTTP is one of the, the, the examples where you add in the middle some uh, middle boxes. But nowadays, most of the business in the internet is about building those boxes and selling those boxes to some companies, all right? So this is a, a big deal here because basically at the edge, every, everything is already standardized. It's really hard to change HTTP, but transparently, you can put in the middle something that the client and the server are not even aware about. And selling those middle boxes, which are the proxies, is a big deal. And all the innovation nowadays in the internet doesn't really change the way a client's working because changing protocols is not so easy, all right? 
but mainly is through the add-ons, those middle boxes, okay? So next, next class, we will talk about DNS because we already see how TCP is working, even though we have a chapter on TCP, but it was important to talk about it. So here for the next week, we're gonna talk about